Hello, good people. It's time. Time to make that change. What's up? Listen, I've been waiting for y'all all week long. I've been praying for you and asking God. I said, listen, your people need a word. So speak to me so that we could deliver a life-changing, revolutionary word just for you. First, it changed me, and then it's going to change you. I'm so excited that you guys have joined me once again. Here's part 16. Part 16 of this Try Me series. I don't know when we're going to stop. I don't know. I don't even know what I'm doing. I'm just letting like God guide this ship, but I'm just trusting him. We going left? Okay, we going left. We going right? Okay, we going right. So for everybody, if this is your first time, go ahead and drop a comment in the room. As usual, it is my first time. If this is your 16th time, if the Tribe Me series is blessing your life, let me hear you. Let me know. Well, I guess I can't hear you, but let me see you by dropping a comment in the room. I believe tonight is going to be awesome. Are you guys ready? Go ahead and take a screenshot, tag us. Let us know where you're from in the world. I believe this is going to bless your life. Genesis chapter 32 is going to be our foundational text on tonight. Genesis chapter 32, we're going to read a few passages of Scripture. Verses 22 is where we're going to start. Genesis chapter 32, verse 22, and it says, And he arose that night and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven sons, and crossed over the ford of Jabbok. He took them, sent them over the brook, and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go. For the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. So he said to him, what is your name? He said, Jacob. And he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask about my name and he blessed him there so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel for I have seen God face to face and my life is preserved and just as he crossed over Peniel the sun rose on him and he limped on his hip our clause of concern our verse of importance takes residence in two verses verses 27 and 28 so he said to him what is your name he said Jacob and he said your name shall no longer be called Jacob but Israel for you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed God we are excited we are in expectation of what you're going to do on tonight. I pray that this word touches the hearts of your people. Allow it to search the crevices of our heart where if there's any area in our life that we are having rebellion, God, flush it out so that we can be vessels for you. As usual, oh God, I'm asking that you anoint my lips to be the PA system of heaven. It's in your precious son's name we pray. In Jesus' name and everybody who agrees with that prayer, would you put in the room, amen. Amen. What is your name? My name is Jacob. Your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with man and have prevailed. Ladies and gentlemen and everybody watching me on tonight, there's this there's this issue I think we have to confront. And I don't even know if y'all have noticed it. There's this dude. And there's this particular individual that you and I have to deal with. Yeah, we have to deal with him because he has a stalking problem. He has a stalking problem. He keeps stalking me, and he keeps on stalking you. He knows where you live. He knows your favorite shows. He knows what you subscribe to on YouTube and Netflix. He knows your favorite R&B song from the 90s. He even knows your favorite food. This dude even had the audacity to wear your clothes. <laughs> that new purse that you just bought, ma'am, yeah, she had it on too. And them J's that you just brought, my dude, yeah, he had them on too. And sometimes y'all get in these heated arguments. 
Y'all get in these heated arguments because they overpowered you and caused you to do the very thing that you said you wouldn't do anymore. The very thing that you said I'm done with, they caused you to go right back to it. <laughs> they caused you to go right back to it. And I don't know if you know who I'm talking about. So for part 16 of this Try Me series, I would like to introduce the title so that you can know who I'm talking about. I would like to speak for a few moments around this thought from this subject, my evil twin. Yeah. Anybody have one of those? If you say you don't, that's proof right there that you have one. Everybody, my evil twin. How about try confrontation? My evil twin, that, that person on the inside of you that keeps overpowering you. My evil twin. And church, let me go ahead and give you this disclaimer. Let me go ahead and clear the air. Tonight's message is not for people who have an issue with admitting that they have issues. This message is not for you. Tonight's message is not for the holier than thou or the religious who claim to know God, but then they can't extend grace and mercy to anybody. Now, they'll readily receive grace and mercy, but then when it's time to extend it, they, <coughs> they start <coughs> coughing and, <coughs> and choking when it's time to extend the language of grace to somebody else besides themselves. How is it? How is it that you turn into a judge when you know somebody's flaw? But then, oop, you turn into a lawyer when they know your flaw. <laughs> yeah, th th this message is not for you. This message is not for individuals who have branded the statement, only God can judge me over my life as a permission slip to live riotous and not be corrected. I've learned when people say only God can judge me, what they're really saying is don't try to correct me. <laughs> don't, try to, don't try to correct me. Only God can judge me. My dude, that's Tupac, not scripture. <laughs> That's Tupac Shakur, not scripture. Truthfully, I believe anybody could judge you, but only God can sentence you. Yeah, th th this message is not for you. But this message is for anybody who has been given an assignment, who has a call on their life, who has a purpose. And when you consider what you have to go through to get through. When you consider what you have to go through to get through, you become like Jesus and you're like, God, if it be possible, take this cup away from me. This message is for people who have ever been like King Rehoboam. You heard the counsel and the wisdom of the elders, but instead you decided to follow the advice from your friends and suffer for it. As anybody else besides myself, they'll be honest enough to say a lot of the trouble I got into was due to the people I call friends. A lot of the trouble, just like drop a hand raise emoji. Don't leave me out here. I'm going to raise both of my hands. Don't have me looking like a referee holding up a touchdown signal. Is there anybody else that like some of my friends, and I understand it was me. I'm not putting all blame on them. I take some responsibility. It was me. It was me, oh, Lord, standing in the need of prayer. But it was my friends who also helped me hurt me. My friends introduced me to weed. My friends introduced me to porn. My friends introduced me to lesbianism. My friends took me to the club. My friends said, wear your cleavage out like this. Is there anybody else that the people that you call friends got you in trouble? This is why I believe we have to have God voices in our life. I'm getting on my soapbox. God voices in our life because there's so much content and there's so much information and intel about how to identify distractions and how to identify counterfeits and how to identify devils and how to identify demons. But can you identify the God voices in your life? Because just like the enemy sends people, God sends people. And can you identify that God voice? Because that God voice sometimes is going to get on your nerves. That God voice sometimes is going to correct you. That God voice is going to hold you accountable. And anytime you're a sensitive individual and you want to do what you want to do, the person who's holding you accountable, they feel like they're attacking you. But that's that God voice. Can you identify the God voice? Because that's the voice that you should honor. That's the voice that you should sow into. That's the voice that you should appreciate. And personally, I'm in a season, I can't speak for anybody else but myself. I'm in a season where I cannot be surrounded by people who are giving me advice and they have not been heavenly advised. 
who give me advice, but they have not been heavenly advised. Not in this season, maybe in another season, but not due to the warfare I'm facing, not due to the giants I'm trying to slay, not due to the stuff I'm trying to break, not due to the things I'm trying to get off my bloodline. No, I don't need advice. I need to hear a word. You didn't log on here tonight to hear some Google plagiarized, pinch your stolen quote message. You need to hear a word. I need to know what heaven is saying. I want to be in a place where the soundtrack of heaven is. I need some, a place that has an oil on it because it's the anointing that breaks yokes. And every time you hear the word of God, something should break. Every time you hear the word of God, prayer life should increase. I need an anointed word. Somebody say, I need a word. I need a word. I don't need just advice. Listen, please hear me. Please exercise extreme caution with who you're leasing your ear to. Because wrong people give you wrong directions. And wrong directions lead to wrong destinations, and wrong destinations put you in recovery seasons. I need to say that again. Wrong people give you wrong directions, and wrong directions lead you to wrong destinations, and wrong destinations put you right back in recovery season. And I'm tired of living in recovery. Is anybody there? I'm tired of living in recovery. I need to advance. Stop letting people give you advice who have not been heavenly advised. They don't have to live with the outcome you do. They don't have to live with the outcome you do. Stop letting people use your hardest practice while they discover themselves. Get on my soapbox. Why am I coming out so hard? Exercise caution because I need to recognize that some choices that are surrounding me have destiny weight on it. And I can't just let this choice go up to your advice or how you feel or what you think. No, I need some oil. I need some anointing. I need to know what God is saying. Somebody say a word. I need to have more conversations with kingdom brainstormers versus anxiety spawners. I need to have more conversations with kingdom brainstormers versus anxiety spawners. Those people be like, girl, I don't know why you're volunteering like that. I don't know why you keep watching the Try Me series. I don't know why you're going to church. I don't know why you're doing all that. Uh-uh, see, I would leave. I don't, I, I, that's too much work. I would leave. Listen, you don't have to live with the outcome. They don't have to live with the outcome. You do. My wife shared this before. She said before we met, she had a bad church breakup. There was nothing as messy as a church breakup. If you never had one, you don't want one. But one of the messiest places that you, could, that you could have a breakup is at church. And it's even messier when you're on stage as the choir director and singing in the choir and the person that you broke up with is on the drums. <laughs> she said it was difficult. And then the person who hooked us up, she ended up being with him and they cheated on me together. And you hooked me up with him. They did like the usher on her. You made me want to leave the one I'm with, start a new relationship with you. Y'all pray for me. Y'all pray for me. <laughs> Y'all pray for me. So she was like, I wanted to leave the church, but I didn't. And a year later, I came to the church. So God made sure of it where the very place that was your pain place, a year later became your blessed place. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean leave. Just because it's hard does not mean leave. See, some of us, what if I told you that the place that you're at right now, it's not by accident, but it's by intentionality. What if I told you that the place you're at is not by accident, but it's by providence? And I know you're praying and asking God to change it, but what I've learned about God is many times the very thing that you're asking God to change is what he's using to change you. <laughs> I felt like that just hit somebody's life. The very thing that you're asking God to change is the very thing that God is using to change you. And I know you're trying to rebuke it, but the problem is you've been given the power to rebuke devils and demons, but you cannot rebuke that which God is using as surgery. God is behind this. And listen, I want us to be encouraged. Just because it's difficult doesn't mean give, don't mean give up. It doesn't mean throw in the towel. Don't get discouraged, depressed, oppressed. Delayed does not mean denied. Y'all going to make me get old school up in here. I know I'm new school, but I grew up old school. If David was here, he would tell you, won't he do it? Show you right, he'll do it. 
He will anoint you king over Israel while Israel still has a king and then just leave you in the pasture. If Abraham was here, he would say, won't he do it? Show you right, he'll do it. He'll give you a promise and then have you wait 25 years before the promise ever becomes a reality. If Joseph was here, he would say, won't he do it? Show you right, he'll do it. You have a dream that won't even make sense until 13 years later. And if Noah was here, he would say, won't he do it? Show you right, he'll do it. He'll tell you to build for something that you've never even seen before. I don't even know what rain is, but God has a method of building you before exposing you. This message, this message is for people who are like the Apostle Paul. When I desire to do good, that, that evil twin is always with me. So that the good I want to do, that I don't do. But the evil I don't want to do, that I do. It's a struggle. And that struggle is real. Can I get somebody to say the struggle is real? Yeah, that, that struggle is real. But listen, just because that struggle is real, it does not mean it has to have generational momentum. So we're going to have to break it. But the only way we can break it is we have to confront our evil twin. We have to confront our evil twin. And my desire, my desire on tonight may come off a little unorthodox, unusual, or maybe even anomalous. But you are invited with me for the time allotted with me to take off your title, to take off your mask. Forget that you're a husband, wife, brother, son, uncle, grandparent. Forget your title that you're part of the clergy, trustee member, trustee uh, board member, whatever. Forget your title. Let's leave all of that at the door. And let's see, do we have any honest people in the room who will say, listen, sometimes doing the right thing, I don't want to do it, but for me to do the right thing, it's a struggle. Time for that hand raise emoji. Anybody else honest enough to say, listen, sometimes I don't want to do the right thing. And if I be real with you on tonight, I don't care who's watching. If you look at all the comments, everybody, that's me, that's me, yep, that's me, mm -hmm, yep, that's me, yep, me too. You too, girl, yeah, that's me. Sometimes I don't want to do the right thing. And it's a struggle, and that struggle is real. Sometimes I don't want to bite my tongue. I want to give that heifer a piece of my mind. The struggle is real. Sometimes I want to go back to the club scene. I know I've been out of it for a while, but sometimes I want to go back. Can I be honest? The struggle is real. Yes, I thought about responding to that text that my ex sent me a few days ago because I'm kind of lonely. The struggle is real. I don't know if God's going to have somebody for me to marry. I've been waiting for what, five, six, seven, ten? I've been waiting for so long, and I'm starting to doubt, is marriage even a part of my flight plans? And I'll be honest, I'm starting to get some trust issues. The struggle is real. I'm thinking about going back to that sexual morality. I know I shouldn't do it. I know that God has better for me. But if I just be honest, open, naked, and transparent right now, sometimes I want to go back. The struggle is real. The, the, the addiction of pornography is here. The struggle is here. Anxiety is here. The struggle is real. Bitterness is here. The struggle is real. Pride is here. The struggle is real. Depression is here. The struggle is real. The good I want to do, that I don't do. But the evil that I don't want to do, that I do, and it's a struggle, and I just feel it's necessary that before we fully board the excursion of this preaching presentation, that I have a litmus test, that I can see do we have any honest people in the room, or do we have a, peop a room filled with people who have been stung by the religious bug? <laughs> you know what the religious bug is, right? That's those people who present smiles, but internally they're broken. They're broken, but they're smiling on the outside. These are the people who wear masks. And here's the dangerous thing. When you are surrounded by people who wear masks, it makes you entertain the Mardi Gras of artificial. And so you end up exchanging your authenticity for the beads of their acceptance. Did y'all hear what I just said? It traps you in the Mardi Gras of artificial. And you'll exchange your authenticity for the beads of their acceptance. So every time you're around them, you'll wear a mask. Yeah, I'm trying to see if there are any real people that say, listen, there's a struggle in my life. I may not talk about it. I may carry myself well, but there's some struggles I'm going through. And I'm wondering who's going to deliver me from this body of death. And I'm tired of fighting with this evil twin. And I want you to understand that sometimes the struggle is not always resisting sin.
For somebody watching this message, you know what your struggle is? For you to see yourself the way that God sees you versus how you see you. Because you keep comparing your behind the scenes to everybody else's highlight reel. That's your struggle. You know what somebody else's struggle is who's watching this? Learning how to silence your inner critic. Because your inner critic keeps you subscribed to the channel of your own negativity. And so you keep on saying, that's not good enough. That's not perfect. No, that every I is not dotted. Every T is not crossed. It got to be perfect. It got to be excellent. No, that wasn't good enough. Who going to read it? Who gonna? Maybe that's your issue. Learning how to turn off the inner critic. All of us, in some way or another, have some sense of a struggle. And this is why this, this imagery that we have been selling for years, that Christians and church attendees, that we have it perfect, is why everybody in the world calls us hypocrites. You know why? Because we keep on presenting ourselves as the finished product versus a work in progress. Woo. I wonder how many souls we could win if we carried ourselves like a work in progress instead of, a finished prog- instead of the finished product. God still has some work to do on me too. And if you look at my life, I want you to notice how I'm growing. There should be a used to, not a still do. And maybe if we were to allow people to know about stuff we used to do versus we still do, we could win more people. By saying, hey, I'm a work in progress versus I'm the finished product. And we need to stop selling this, this toxin, this makeup toxin of looking the part. What the heck is church clothes? <laughs> we wear this makeup, this makeup to look the part. And so we have sanctuaries, especially before COVID, that were filled with people who had facelifts, but they didn't have heart transplants. So now <laughs> we hide our issue because everybody else seems perfect. Everybody else seems perfect. Great praise and worship. Awesome creativity. No word. Beautiful lights, perks, sound system, everything wonderful. No depth. And so when you have sanctuaries and communities filled with people who are really fake and they go out into a real world and they discover real problems, they doubt the existence of a real God because you didn't give me depth how to handle real struggles and real issues. And I didn't know that if I keep on behaving this way, I could behave my way into a season. And how in the world are you going to curse God from the rain from a storm that you behave your way into? So many times I think we're not seeing the full results of a thing because we don't see it through. I want you guys to see this really quickly, all right? We're not seeing the results because we're not seeing it through. All right. So God has a way of always telling you to do something crazy. Like this bag of water right here, right? Y'all tell me, if I stick this pencil in this bag, what's going to happen? I said, water going to come out. So... God asks you to do some crazy stuff, right? So he's going to say, hey, I I want you to do something crazy, like stick this pencil through here and trust me. And so a lot of us never do it. And so since we never do it, we never see the miracle that if God tells us to do a thing, and if you continue to do it, and if you see it through, you're not going to lose nothing. And then it takes for you to see, man, if God got me through that, let, let me see if I could take a greater risk. Is God going to help me through this? Is God going to get me through that? And you'll see like, wow, if I trust God through the harder stuff, then once you trust God through one thing, you could trust him through several things. Some of y'all look like, oh, my God, he's doing magic. No, I'm not. This is just what faith looked like. God tells you, I need you to start that ministry. You don't know how you're going to do it. You think all your money's going to pour out. You think all of your friends are going to leave you. God says, no, just Trust me, I want you to do it. And if you see it through, you'll see the miracle. Are y'all seeing this? <laughs> are y'all seeing this? Well, hello, everybody. I hope that you are enjoying the message thus far. I can't tell you how many times I practiced this. <laughs> I was telling my wife, I hope that this does not bust right in the middle of my illustration. Um, I know for some this may seem like a minor example, but it packs a lot of gravity because I think a lot of us are scared of failure. So we won't see it through, we won't try because we're scared that it possibly, just like this illustration, will burst. But there's this pattern I'm just seeing in scripture. I'm seeing this marriage between radicals and miracles. 
And I just felt a need to come on here for a short moment to tell somebody you'll never see the miracle as long as you don't get radical. There is just something about it's better to embrace the discomfort of taking the risks than lay in the cemetery of familiarity. And I just want to challenge you, whatever it is that God is calling for you to do, take the risk. He won't let you drown. He won't let you fail. God is going to help you see it through. Let's get back to the message. You ever get to a place where I'm going to just take the risk? I'm going to just take the risk, and I want to see what God can do in my life. I'm going to take the chance because I don't know what the outcome is going to be, but I don't have to know the outcome because when you first saw this bag, you know what the people here said? If you put a pencil through, it's going to bust. But did it bust? <laughs> so I think God many times is telling you, I need you to trust me and step out this boat. Step out this boat. I know there's water all around you. I know that the wind is blowing all around you, but trust me because if you trust me, I'll show you that you're a miracle worker. So let, let's, let's journey back to our text. Can I get somebody to say, faith? The reason all your peace is leaking out is because you don't see it through. You keep pulling out and giving up. If we journey back to our foundational text and we look at this dude in Genesis chapter 32, verse 24, it says, then Jacob was left alone and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of day. Man, this is so loaded. This is so loaded. I don't have enough time. I'm going to try to speed through it. Jacob's life, he's been a deceiver. He's been a con artist. He's been a manipulator. He's been a liar. He's been a trickster. And now who he has been is catching up to him. Because you can never outrun you. You could try. This is why some people went ghost on you. You thought that they went ghost on you, but they're going self-ghost. They're trying to run away from themselves. And being with you in that relational context was causing for who they really were to catch up. And so they had to keep running. But eventually the real you was going to make his debut. He sit here. He's been a trickster, a liar his whole life. He hears his brothers coming. Y'all remember his brother Esau? His brother Esau, he's that dude that he took the birthright from over some lentil stew. His brother Esau is coming. He's the same brother that Jacob put on wool's clothes and took Esau's blessing and took the inheritance and took the birthright. This guy is coming because he's coming to get Jacob. So Jacob is terrified. He's terrified. He sends all these gifts before him so that hopefully once Esau sees the gifts, he'll relent in his anger and he won't harm me. God, when I was studying, I was like, this is such a word. Because this is what a lot of pastors do. They put their gift before you, so hopefully you never see I'm a, manip I'm a manipulator. Yeah, maybe, maybe if I could be a very, very good speaker, they'll never see I'm really Jacob. I'm a trickster. Maybe if I could be a very, very good singer, and if I could put my gift before you, you'll never notice I'm really Jacob. So he's wrestling with this man. I'm like, who is this man? Who, who is this man? Could you imagine how scary that is? It's pitch black, and somebody gets over you and starts wrestling you. Could you imagine how terrified you would be? <laughs> I'm like, who is this man? I'm glad y'all asked. It's the same man we see in the text that when Abraham saw, he ran up to him, and he says, if I have found favor in your sight, please do not pass me by. Yeah, it's that man. It's the same man that after King Nebuchadnezzar was disrespected, he felt like they disrespected him by not bowing down to the golden statue. He threw the three Hebrew boys in the fire. But then he goes up to the fiery furnace and he's like, uh, hold up, wait a minute. I know I put three people in the fire, but I see four people. And the fourth one has the appearance of the son of God. Yeah, yeah, that man, here's a little theology for you, is called a theophany. A theophany. It's a pre-incarnated version of the God-man. Now, you know who the God-man is? Jesus. So good. Theophany, some other theologians call it Christophany. They're both interchangeable. This is a pre-incarnated version of Jesus. He's wrestling with God. He's wrestling and he's struggling with God. And as I begin to read this text, something powerful stands out to me. In verse 25, it says, Now when he saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of his hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, Let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Hold on, wait a minute. He's wrestling with him. And he recognizes I'm not overpowering him. So he touches his hip. This is so powerful. He touches Jacob's hip. And this is just proof to me 
that when God really touches you, you walk different. Y'all missed it. When God touches you, you walk different. When God touches you, you talk different. When God touches you, you crave different. When God touches you, you think different. There was a study a long time ago where there was a group of babies and some nurses came in and all they did was change their diaper. But then there was another group of babies that the nurse would come in, they would change their diaper, they would shake the little rattler, they would say goo goo and gaga, and they would play with them. And over time, the experience revealed, the experiment revealed, the children who went untouched were mean, they always cried, they never really sleep well at night, but the other children seem to have a better attitude. This explains to me why we have mean Christians. Maybe they never had his touch. I'm about to run off this stage. Maybe they never had his touch because once you've been touched by the king of glory, stuff changes. The darkness is symbolic of Jacob's life. He's lived a life of darkness. And I'm like, how in the world does he shift from wrestling to holding? Did y'all read the text? He says, let me go for day breaks. I won't let you go until you bless me. How in the world did this go from a WWE WrestleMania tournament to now I'm holding on to you and I'm not letting you go until you bless me? I believe the darkness was Jacob's state. And when it dawned on him, please pay attention. Every word is intentional. When it dawned on him, what is dawn? That is when the sun is rising and you're allowed to see some sunlight. When it dawned on him, I believe when the sun started to rise and the sun began to shine on the sun. Y'all missed it. (laughs) When the sun began to rise, S-U-N, and it began to shine on the sun, S-O-N, on the sun. And Jacob recognized who he was wrestling. He went to holding and he said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. I'm trying to get somebody to understand you have been wrestling with God. The stuff that you don't want to deal with, the stuff that you've been fighting. What if God is using it to change you? What if God is using it to prepare you? What if God is using it to mold you? What if God is using it to chisel you? What if God is using it to build you? What if God is using it to construct you? And in this moment, Jacob recognized, I'm not just wrestling with a man. I'm wrestling with God. I'm wrestling with God. And he said, I'm not going to let you go. I'm not going to let you go. I I recognize I'm not going to let you go. I'm wrestling with God. And then he says, what is your name? (laughs) Total change of the conversation. (laughs) We've been fighting all night long. We've been fighting. And then I switch from wrestling to holding. And then you're going to turn around and be like, so what's your name? (laughs) He says, My name is Jacob. Now, you got to understand, it's the same vibe that God had when God was walking in the garden in the cool of the day when he said, Adam, where are you? It's not that God was bad at hide and seek. He knew exactly where Adam was. But Adam, do you know where you are in your mind where you tried to find pleasure outside of me? Do you know where you are in your heart that you try to find fulfillment outside of me? What is your name? He's telling him to address who he's been. My name is Jacob. I'm a liar. I'm a deceiver. I'm an adulterer. I'm a drug dealer. I'm a fornicator. I'm a gambler. I'm an alcoholic. I'm a masturbator. I'm a liar. This is who I've been. God is asking for you to deal with with that evil twin, the person that you've been hiding. Because listen, please get this, please get this. God can never anoint who you pretend to be. He can only anoint the authentic self. How do I know this? Because once he asked him what his name is, and he said, Jacob, then he said, your name is no longer Jacob. Your name will be called Israel, right? (laughs) And then the Bible says, he blessed him there. I want you to see this, please get this. When you're wrestling, you can't get blessed. When you're holding, you still can't get blessed. Oh, but when you confess, why is this so important? Because it's called repentance. Confess your faults one to another. God, I have sinned. He was acknowledging who he was. He was acknowledging who he's been. He's acknowledging who the evil twin has been his whole life. Who is that evil twin? It's your flesh, ma'am. It's your flesh, sir. And he's saying, have you recognized that I'm better than that? That I can fulfill you more than that? That I can put my spirit on the inside of you and you can see my wonder and you can see my glory and you can see my power, but you got to denounce the evil twin. You have to repent. I'm not talking about remorse because you can be snotting and crying and not change. Acknowledge it. What's your name? 
name is Jacob. Your name is no longer Jacob. Your name is Israel. For you have wrestled, you have struggled with God. That's that theophany. With God and man and have prevailed. See, all of us, everybody, myself included, we all have a Jacob and we all have an Israel. And here's the thing. God knows about your Israel. The devil knows if you ever become Israel, he won't have a grip on you. So if he could keep on showing you all your Jacob, if he could keep on having you have conversations with that evil twin, you'll never walk in your Israel self. So so how, how, how do I overcome this? How do I get point number one? Confess him. Confess him. He confessed who he was, Jacob. And this is the thing. A lot of us feel as though, you know, I'm too dirty. I've done too much dirt. Um, I've sinned too much. I'm not worthy for God to bless me. I'm not worthy for God to do good things to me. I'm sitting here looking at this. Do you understand that God began to refer to himself as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? This is problematic. You know why? Because I'm like, no, 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 no. You mean you're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, you just changed his name, Lord. You made a mistake. <laughs> Sorry, let me correct you, Lord. You made a mistake. You're not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. He's like, nope. I'm the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. What is he saying? Jacob was your sin. Jacob was your struggle. I'm the God of your struggle. I'm the God of your struggle. Even when it's difficult, I'm still God. Even when you're hurting, I'm still God. Even when you feel dirty, I'm still God. You're not too dirty for me. You're not too messy for me. You haven't fallen too many times for me to pick you up again. I want you to understand how all of this stuff breaks down. When he said he's the God of Abraham, he's saying I'm the God that I'm a promise keeper. (laughs) He promised Abraham a promise. When he says I'm the God of Isaac, I'm a covenant keeper. When he says I'm the God of Jacob, I'm the God of your struggle. So how do I overcome this evil twin? First, you've got to confess that you have an evil twin. Point number two, how do you get over the evil twin? You starve them. You starve them. How do you starve the flesh? You fast. I've been saying this almost every week. You turn down the volume of your flesh. And the reason you fast, don't let these people lie to you. You don't do it for houses, cars, or or for promotion. You fast to turn down the volume of your flesh. You fast. You starve it. You don't feed it. If that's unsubscribing from certain YouTube channels, turning off Netflix, deleting Netflix, or deactivating your social media account, whatever it is, you starve it. Because your evil twin is only as strong as you feed him. And you can't feed one more than the other and expect one to be stronger. Somebody say, starve him. Last one, just like our illustration, see it through. See it through. Me holding up that bag of water, just looking at it, you would think it's going to bust. Seeing it through, go all the way through, that's how your joy remains. That's how your faith remains. That's how your confidence remains. All of us have an evil twin. But God's saying, "Mm -mm. you're not Jacob. You're Israel. But you can't get blessed until you acknowledge who you are. And you can't get blessed until you shift from wrestling to holding. So God, we pray. Give us the hearts. Give us the mind to recognize maybe the principles that we've been wrestling with, maybe the things that we've been struggling with is not just things in our life making our life hard. No, this is you. This is you. And just like Jacob, oh God, once it dawned on him who he was wrestling with, he shifted to holding on. Help us to be people who hold on to your promise. Hold on to your unfailing love for us. Hold on to your word. Hold on to who you are, God, because the safest place we can be is in your hands. And we pray most importantly, God, that we denounce our evil twin, the flesh that's had power over us for too long, the flesh that's been telling us what to do, that's been this lifelong bully of controlling us. Deliver us from that, oh God, because we want to be spirit-led individuals, not flesh-oppressed children. Help us be that. In Jesus' name we pray.